Okay, now we're recording. Um, so just a few announcements to start. Um, so uh, the next meeting was originally planned to be a hybrid meeting, but got the message from the FIP so a week or so ago that they are closed that week for maintenance. Um, originally, there was going to be a print competition, so that's not going to happen because it's Zoom only. Uh, anyway, we'll, we will still have a good salon meeting. The the Jill set out the usual uh, announcement about the salon, and she got the the emails from people with prints, so that's good. This down. Yes, David. Um, later in the summer, because of summer camp, all of our meetings are going to be Zoom only, or except for the scavenger hunt, which will be uh, in person and not something that's shared at all. Uh, and then Ken has been, Ken Walter has been the N4C coordinator for five years. Thank you much, Ken. But uh, it's time to find a replacement. So I'll be working on that. If there are any um, volunteers, let me know. Okay, that's the end of announcements. So um, this is the information from our website about J. Arthur Anderson, who is here, thank you. And he's gonna tell us about the Badlands. Uh, Terry, do you have any other introductory, introductory thoughts? Well, when I asked John to do this, uh, I thought it was uh, just the perfect um, program. Uh, it's, you know, a lot of people travel for photography and uh, the Badlands is a, you know, a half a day's drive away. You don't have to buy an airplane ticket. And um, it's, it's truly a wonderful place. And to have someone who knows that park so well, uh, I just thought it was important that John be here to tell us about you know, all the ins and outs of everything. Great. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to you, John, and you can turn on yours and I'll get. Okay, okay you're, you're able to hear me good? Yep. And is this recording now? Can you yes. Know? Okay. So uh, I didn't put a lot of thought into the title called Badlands Adventure, but let's hope that, uh, you know, that's really what we, uh, we'd like to have a good time, a good productive uh, time as a photographer. Maybe if it's too adventuresome, that means too many things have uh, happened. And when, uh, sometimes when things are exciting, uh, that's not good a good thing. <laughs> so, but anyway, I called it the Badlands Adventure. Um, I've been going out to the Badlands, oh, I don't know, maybe um, probably about 20 years. And kind of what got me um, going out there, I had been going to um, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the North and South units of Theodore Roosevelt, because I'm from North Dakota and pretty loyal to North Dakota. Um, and, and then, I went to the Badlands and there was no going back because it was such a, a, a great opportunity. Um, and, you know, Rick Fleur, uh, who you may know, uh, a pretty accomplished uh, photographer, uh, also very accomplished with Adobe products. 
he did an uh, artist in residency at the Badlands. And he, so he, uh, I remember he did a presentation about that artist in residency. And, and uh, that kind of inspired me to give it a shot. So, um, uh, uh, so typically when we think about the Badlands, we think about the Badlands in South Dakota, and that's the area um, around Wall, South Dakota. Um, but really, technically, both uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Park, both the North and South units are also technically part of the Badlands as well. And then it's hard to think about the Badlands in South Dakota without also uh, thinking about Custer State Park. Uh, it's a state park, uh, but it is uh, at par with the Badlands, what it has to offer. And it's just a few miles from Rapid City. So um, to, to not go to Custer would be an omission that if, uh, if you're going to go to the Badlands, you should uh, schedule time to be in Custer. Um, uh, something about the way that I think about national parks is I pretty much don't go to national parks between Memorial and Labor Day because there's just so much pressure on them. It's just hard to do what I want to do. So I'm usually going on the off season and unlike Wall, South Dakota, Rapid City uh, hotel costs rates go way down um, after Labor Day. And, and so you can get a $100 room for more like $40 in Rapid City. The prices at Wall uh, never go down or, or not appreciably. And, and so they keep them pretty high. Um, and so staying in Rapid City uh, in the off season is one of the best uh, travel values that you'll find. Um, if you're thinking of going to Theodore Roosevelt, uh, there's uh, Watford City, uh, that's the North unit, and there's Medora. Um, and both of them were affected by the oil boom. And so, um, uh, and also by tourism, of course. Um, and so if I were going to stay in a hotel um, at Theodore Roosevelt uh, Park, especially during the season, I would be going to Dickinson, which is not that far away. It's only like 30 miles. Um, and you're going to get a much better value uh, for um, hotels and maybe a better range of restaurants as well. Um, so this is a map of, uh, of the uh, Badlands National Park. And I'm going to, I embedded this map uh, in many places in the presentation because I thought it would be important to, to tell you what I want to do is, is do the what, where, when, and how sort of presentation. So as we talk about different um, animals uh, or opportunities, I'll point them out on a map so that you can have a sense of, of where you would go in the Badlands. But let's just do a quick overview. When you're coming in on Highway 90 over here, um, your first opportunity to exit to the Badlands is exit 131. It's pretty well marked. Uh, there's this Minuteman missile visitor center, so there's a sign about that. There's also a sign um, um, that tells you the, the Badlands. Now you could you could keep going for another 20 miles or so and and then go to just the straight wall. And that's what most people do, I think, is that they, they go to wall because there's lots of advertisement about wall and all that. And so you could enter the Badlands uh, from the north um, but this is a loop, and it's uh, 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 and if you get kind of excited like I do, it takes like eight or nine hours to drive out there. Um, I want to get there as soon as possible, and so exiting on one thirty one and just going in this way um, 
you get to the northeast entrance, and then that's where the moonscapes start in the in the Badlands. And it's just marvelous. Most of them come up on your left side, uh, right through here. You're going by through Cedar Pass, right here. But but um, there's a, a major parking lot that you come into uh, before you get to the visitor center. And uh, uh, if you go to that parking lot right to right in here, um, you'll see some landforms if you take the boardwalk and walk around this this hill. I don't know what you call it, but this butte or whatever. When you get to the other side, it is just it looks like you're on the moon. It's such a dramatic uh, landscape, and so. That's what you can see there. Um, uh, and so I'm going to take you up the trip throughout the presentation uh, up uh, this uh, Highway 240 and tell you what can be seen. And then there's another part. Uh, when you get to the pinnacles, okay, uh, then there is the Sage Creek Rim Road over here, okay? Um, and that's really important too. So there's the 240, and then there's the Sage Creek Road, and and those are really integral to understanding how the Badlands works. Okay. Um, try to think if there's anything important else to talk about here. We'll get back to the map as we go. Um, I'm not a landscape photographer. In fact. I, you know, I kind of got started off as a nature and wildlife, but I, I, I think it was an expression of my hunter-gatherer uh, uh, genetics or something that I, instead of being a hunter, I'm not opposed to hunting. I choose to hunt with, with a camera, and and I, I am always struck I, uh, at at how many of the rituals and things that go along with hunting uh, also play out in in photography, you know, especially when you travel in small group and you sit around the campfire and talk about the ones that got away and the ones that didn't get away and all the adventures and all that. And so it has a lot of the same elements as, as what hunters for hundreds of years have, have experienced. Um, and so uh, landscapes never really, uh, I don't, never was really motivated to stop long enough to take a picture of the landscape. So, so I want you to know whenever you see a landscape shot, it's going against my brain. But I would uh, encourage you to always stretch yourself. And so you'll see this is a stretch for me. And if they're not as good as your landscape pictures, you'll know why. Um, so again, what dramatic... Uh, Landforms. These are all sedimentary landforms. This is the uh, bottom of what used to be a great ocean, and and so there are many, many, uh, uh, maybe millions of years of sediment uh, uh, collected here, and it's a great place because of that um, to find fossils. They found many important fossils within the. Um, the Badlands. And also, uh, all the landforms are sedimentary, and so they're subject to uh, the effects of erosion. Um, and, and it's almost like popcorn density to a lot of the stuff. And so uh, this is a forever changing landscape. And, and I've watched certain landforms erode and go away. Uh, even in the short time that I've been going there, you can see the effects of, of uh, the um, erosion. It's also semi-arid. And so there's not, uh, um, they end up with uh, a soil moisture uh, deficit fairly early on, uh, even in the winter time. People, uh, I, I love to be in the Badlands in the winter time. Um, and they'll say, well, aren't you worried about the snow? And I've been there many times and there's been no snow. 
if you're from the Dakotas, you realize, unlike Minnesota, where <clears throat> snow is a vertical phenomenon, in the Badlands, in North Dakota and South Dakota, snow is a horizontal phenomenon. And that means it just blows away and it often doesn't stay put. And so you can be in the Badlands in the middle of January and not be walking on snow. And even depending upon how much moisture they had, I've, I've kicked the, the soil in, and not have it been frozen. There's just been no moisture. It's just been dry dust, okay? And so it's really a dry environment. Uh, the trick in taking pictures like this is finding a composition, a center of interest. And often that's helped by whatever the landscape is, or I mean, um, uh, the sky and, and um, the horizon. This is, remember I was telling you that area behind that hill as you come in, this is what it looks like, okay. Uh, this is a little bit, uh, this is off of the Sage Creek Road, uh, where you've got some of these really nice gorges and um, and create, you know, there's other angles and stuff that you can work for. You can really see, and there's some parts of the Badlands where, where you get this wonderful red, these wonderful reds. Sometimes it's green uh, layers, um, uh, but... Um, um, just really uh, nice color in the strat strata. We like going out uh, first thing in the morning and catching um, uh, the sunrise. Uh, and we always hope that we're going to have an interesting sky uh, and not what we would call bulletproof clouds. We want a little bit of uh, we want the sun to be able to peek through. This is almost my favorite picture of the Badlands. Um, off through that valley there, uh, about 30 miles away, is um, uh, scenic, and then not far from that is Lombly and Pine Ridge and New Ridge. So if you just go off to the left, uh, that's where we're at. And to my right, about, well, I would say 20 miles north is well. This is Cedar Pass. This is not Photoshop. This was, um, um, and so the Cedar Pass uh, is, uh, is this sharp uh, curves and all that right before you get to the visitor center. Um, uh, in the park. Um, this is also one of my favorite landforms. I I uh, do photography for the American Indian Movement, and their logo is a is a native face with uh, feathers done in kind of like a peace sign or a victory sign, and so that's what I see when I see those two sticking up. Remember, I told you the landscape is already is always changing. One of those fingers fell down, and so I'm I'm not sure what the statement now is, <laughs> uh, but it's just one sticking up now. Um, I think this is one of the nicest uh, uh, views uh, in the Badlands, and I don't know the name of this peak here, but you'll see it appear in some of the other photographs. Uh, this photograph I I I did for the uh, 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 spring break. So this one is a lie. This one is a composition or a composite image. And so you'll see interesting things like this, where you you learn that the uh, uh, um, brush will will collect on the fence fences out on the prairies and. And that can be just really a, a interesting and wonderful shot. Um, on your way to uh, the Badlands from the Twin Cities at Chamberlain, there's a uh, 
uh, rest area on the east side of Chamberlain, South Dakota, um, where uh, there's this statue that um, uh, I'm called Dignity, which is so well executed uh, and just totally respectful. There you have uh, uh, a Plains Indian woman with a star quilt. Um, I would encourage you to stop there and take whatever best shot you can get at that time of the day or night. And because it's uh, it's got a lot of different looks and, and it's something that's photographable from many different angles. And, and so you can tell the story in a different way in a very, uh, various ways. And it's so nicely situated because you get, I assume that's the Missouri uh, in the back there, and um, uh, and off to the lower right is Chamberlain. Um, there's also a lot of opportunity. So uh, if on your way out or back from going to the Badlands, if you go down the back roads, um, you have uh, uh, lots of farms, farmsteads in decline. And and there's fewer of them every day because uh, since I took this picture, that house has fallen. You can't take this picture anymore. And and so uh, these farms are being bought up. They're becoming more corporate. Uh, they they tend to uh, plow down whatever structures are there. And so that opportunity is going away. But it's a great opportunity right now. Get off the Get off the freeway and start driving some of those back roads, and and you can see scenes like that. This is near Sturgis, this particular barn, and it's um, right in front of uh, I think it's Fair Butte, uh, uh, and so this farm, uh, this barn, is kind of our version of that uh, Mormon row barn in. in um, in Jackson Hole, near Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, and um, I was looking through my old, I was hoping I had a better shot of the barn than this. Uh, I took many shots on the inside. Uh, and, and so it's uh, not all barns are safe to walk in. Uh, uh, this one uh, didn't seem to have that many hazards. So I'd encourage you to go to Sturgis Butte and um, check out this barn um, and and even go in it. So these are the sort. This is an old granary, um, but these are the sorts of structures that uh, that you'll find by getting off the roads. I have to confess that. The one thing that I've not been able to photograph, well, actually, but I, I got a list of things that I would love to photograph in, um, in the Badlands. They have kit foxes. They also have uh, Blackfeet ferrets. Okay, and and if you really work hard and really noodle it and find out how to approach it, that's an opportunity that exists. But I've been going out there a long time, I've not succeeded. Uh, and up until now, this is the first time I was getting a picture of a cougar. <laughs> <laughs> and that's as close as I could get. Um, and this is in a town called Interior, which is well worth checking out because uh, in Interior, the guy who runs the bar and grill in Interior has a row of old 50s, uh, pickup trucks uh, that are just fun to photograph. He also, they also uh, uh, have a fairly inexpensive cheeseburger. Uh, it's a really limited bar menu, but in the middle of uh, uh, shooting in the Badlands, if you've been out since sunrise, uh, they start serving hamburgers at 11, um, and the guy's pretty sociable, um, uh, and, and they're Fairly inexpensive, less than ten dollars, more like eight bucks, um, and and plus, give yourself time to photograph uh, these vehicles that are that are there. 
there is a few uh, places in the Badlands where uh, there are abandoned cars. And, and so if you like that sort of thing, there's uh, you can do that. This is uh, just an old tractor shed uh, we came across. Um, I like old tractors. I, my family has a, a farm background, and so um, I enjoy it. This one I worked up for uh, the creative for spring break as well, inner club. And um, it's a farm all tractor being um, assaulted by aliens. <laughs> um, this is, uh, you've heard about Home on the Range. <laughs> okay, so you can find stuff like this. And this is not saturated at all. This is what uh, this picture looked like on a cloudy day where the colors were just really nicely saturated. I didn't do anything to boost them. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few animals that you can see, and then I'll get into some more in depth. The Badlands is a really good place to see. Uh, it's one of the few places in, that's reachable where you can see both golden and bald eagles. Okay, and I've seen them sitting in the same tree. Uh, and um, and so where I'm going to tell and I'll point it out to you, but go to the uh, Roberts uh, uh, Prairie Dog Town on Sage Creek Road, and um, and there are there's an old farmstead that you'll see out on that road, and very often those trees in that farmstead will have eagles in in them. There's also this variety of hawk. This is the largest hawk that exists, and I never get the name right. It's Feringus hawk. Or, you know, look it up and pronouncing it incorrectly. But it is when you see this, and sometimes they're sitting on the ground, they they look at almost as large as an eagle. And so uh, they're pretty big uh, birds. Um, and they're there for the same reasons as the eagles. Um, if you're afraid of rattlesnakes, you don't really see that many, uh, but when you do, they make an impression. <laughs> and uh, we were watching this guy, and then we saw him slither off into the grass. And it's just like Field of Dreams, that movie, where they go into the corn, and you don't know they're there. And, and so they are, um, I mean, they could be really close, and you don't realize it because of the tall grass. Um, so especially, uh, this might be, it's not really true, but it would be a reason to go to the Badlands after Labor Day because the prospect of running into a snake is much less if you don't go there in the summertime. They also have porcupines. Um, and so uh, as you drive down that Highway 240, frequently I've seen uh, these porcupines in the trees. And um, they're often well disguised because they're, they're, um, they kind of have the same texture and color as the trees in the area. Uh, so just, but, but if you see a clump in a tree, it could well be a porcupine. They're, they're usually pretty easy to photograph. And then antelope. Um, I was so impressed. I started, we were driving down 240 towards the wall and maybe we're about 20 miles away. And we saw this uh, male uh, uh, antelope running alongside of us. And it, we had trouble keeping up with it. And it was going over fences, and all sorts of landforms. And so if you ever have the opportunity to see one of these animals in a full run, um, it is just, I mean, you feel like you're in the Serengeti because they are just so uh, incredible. Um, there are 
antelopes in the Badlands. I've had better luck photographing antelope at Custer. Um, they're not that skittish. So uh, you can very often get closer than you should uh, to an antelope. Um, I, I can't guarantee that they're not going to spook, but but I've been within, you know, like from here to that that doorway from antelope, and and they don't seem to be bothered. Uh, there's the gals. One thing I like about the Badlands and um, one of the colors that I just really enjoy, one of my favorite colors is this color. And, and if you look at all the animals in the Badlands, the bighorn sheep, the mule deer, the antelope, they're almost, even the prairie dogs, they're almost all that same color. Um, I got a phone call from uh, the Utah, uh, the, it was the federal game and the people, the perks people that were running uh, one of the interpretive centers in Utah. And they said, we came across your bighorn sheep pictures um, and we want a permission to use them in one of our uh, instructive uh, presentations. So could we use your pictures? And I said, you've got bighorn sheep in Utah but they're not as pretty as the ones you had in the South Dakota ones. And why are they so pretty? Because the bighorn sheep will take on the color of their surroundings. And their surroundings is this gorgeous gold color, which isn't diminished in the wintertime. It's still there. So it's just beautiful. There's a handsome guy. Okay, prairie dogs. Um, so where do you find prairie dogs? They're right there is the Roberts Prairie Dog Dump. That's going from the pinnacles. So you go to Wall to the pinnacles. There's a right turn. You go up about six miles. And that's where you're going to find prairie dogs, right there. It's not the only place. You'll also find prairie dogs by going to the pinnacles and then going south uh, on 240. And all this area right here, both sides of the road, much of it is prairie dog towns. Now I'm gonna give you, this isn't so much a secret. If you wanna see prairie dogs like you've never seen before, in this case, totally white prairie dog. Where you go is there's this little prairie homestead right here. And there's a prairie dog town that has nothing but pure white prairie dogs. It's amazing. Um, and, um, and so the white ones would be here. And then, uh, especially as you get past, uh, you know, say maybe mile marker uh, 25 or so, which would be right about here uh, through here is prairie dogs on, on both sides and often. The reason you want to see the prairie dog towns is they are what makes the Badlands work from a wildlife point of view. They, I call it the prairie dog buffet, that there's so many animals that are dependent upon the prairie dogs for food, like the golden eagles, the bald eagles, those hawks that I talked about. Um, and then the predators, uh, the badgers, uh, the bobcats, uh, the coyotes. It's all because of the prairie dog buffet that, uh, that they're there. And so things are central to the prairie dogs, even burrowing owls. Um, so if you want to see burrowing owls in, in the Badlands, go to the Roberts Prairie Dog Town, you know, during that period of time that I don't go, um, between Memorial Day in Labor Day, and there's always resident burrowing uh, uh, owls there. So these guys are pretty cute. Um, and um, so they're hard not to photograph. I always try to photograph. There's lots of interactions uh, that are kind of fun to capture. 
you could come up with captions for both of those. Uh, so anyway, if I find myself photographing prairie dogs, it, it means that I'm not having, you know, it's kind of like catching sunfish. What you'd really do is you want to catch walleyes, right? Or musky or something. So if, but I think as a photographer, I'm going to take the best shot available. And sometimes my best shot is uh, prairie dog. One of the things to think about, I don't know how much of a threat it is, but um, um, there used to be signs, and I still come across them, that say that uh, prairie dog towns are, are places where you can catch the bubonic plague. Okay, so don't go into a prairie dog town and eat the dirt. Um, it, it might give you plague. Okay, mule deer. Um, I'm kind of a snob, a North Dakota snob, and in um, in uh, in North in Minnesota and and Wisconsin, they have these these rabbits that they call white-tailed deer. You know, um, that's kind of my put down. You know, you see these small kind of wimpy um, deer, the white tails. Um, well, we're, you know, we have real deer in, in the Dakotas, and they're called mule deer. Um, so I don't know if I just lost the audience or not, but um, so where do you see mule deer in the bed? Um, so the visitor center is right here. So you can very often see mule deer all the way along up to maybe uh, uh, the Dillon Pass. So right through here, uh, especially in the winter time, um, and uh, like many deer, uh, you know, they come out say three in the afternoon to graze, um, and so you can really get a good shot with nice light, and often a really nice silhouette shot at sundown. So look at just how massive that individual is and look at the antlers. They're just, you know, if they were any bigger, we'd be calling that an elk. Same thing. Um, this is what they look like in the winter time. So I'm standing there looking at this mule deer and I go, God, does it get any better than that? And then it does. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, they're again, they're not that skittish. They, I don't know if they're habituated to humans in the Badlands or not, um, but uh, you can often get a pretty good shot without them uh, running off. Coyotes, uh, you know, coyotes are doing every doing well everywhere. I live in South Minneapolis, and we have coyotes and. South Minneapolis. Um, and, and so they're ubiquitous. Uh, they are uh, probably uh, uh, the prominent apex predator in the Badlands. Um, and so um, you can very often see them. Sometimes you're luckier than others. Um, you can tell if there's been um, any poaching or anybody shooting at them because um, if they come close to the road, that means people have been leaving it alone. But but if anybody's been taking shots at them, then they're out of range. Okay, and so so if you see all these coyotes just out of out of range, you'll know that's kind of a symptom that they've been uh, that people have been taking shots at them and stuff. This shot in the next one, uh, I, I, I took these shots in the fog. And you wouldn't know that, but um, it's a technique that, that I've kind of learned over the years by accident, is that um, if you're in a foggy situation and it doesn't look like you're shooting anything, take the shot anyway, because 
when you get it into Photoshop, you can change the sliders, the levels, and all of a sudden the haze goes away and there's an animal there. And what's interesting about that is it's without shadow. Okay, because there's no fog and there's no shadows in the fog. And so you're seeing the animal in a way that you normally don't see them. And why it's easy to photograph coyotes in the fog is they don't think that you can see them. Okay, uh, because they're having trouble seeing you. And, and um, um, so they'll get closer and you'll get really nice textures. Um, here's a good example of, um, of what, what a coyote in the fog. I, I should have maybe um, put in a slide that showed what the picture looked like uh, before you know, with the fog uh, unaltered. Uh, when it comes to shooting and exposing for fog, uh, I would push it as far as I could to the right, uh, as long as you don't blow it out. Uh, all that data is gonna be able to be recoverable through those sliders, and then you'll get a picture like this. This is not in the fog. Now, coyotes cycle. You know, you've heard about rabbits and coyotes and all that, and that they go through uh, highs and lows. And, and they're subject to things like mange and, and like that. And, um, and so every once in a while, you'll hear about them having a particularly difficult time um, and and they're not doing well. Um, and and so I, I don't want to say that that's good news. Maybe I am. Uh, because when that happens and they go into decline, then you have the opportunity to photograph other apex predators. These guys all look healthy. Um, and so one of the other apex predators, the ones that I care about most was the bobcats. So when um, when the coyotes, when you see lots of coyotes, you're not going to see bobcats, okay? And I'll tell you that story a little bit more. Um, but if they're on decline, that gives the bobcats um, uh, an opportunity to, to be more dominant. In, in the environment. And um, uh, so I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, one of the things that's been uh, uh, identified is the fact that badgers and coyotes are in cahoots with one another. They often hunt together and they cooperate. Um, and so uh, so it's, it's documented. People have taken photographs of and movies of coyotes and badgers working together at the Prairie Dog Buffet. So uh, these guys get dug in, and um, and what they'll do is they'll uh, they'll obscure themselves, and then at some opportune moment, they'll come jumping out, and hopefully they'll they'll get a prairie dog, and so. Uh, be checking on, uh, and when you go out um, and looking at these prairie dog towns, their holes look a little bit different than the prairie dog mouths. Okay, and, and so be looking for that pattern and that white because there isn't anything out there that's white like that. And so, uh, and, and um, if you do it right, you won't startle them and if they go in the hole, you have to sit out there for an hour before they'll come out. You know, so so if you put too much pressure on them, you'll lose the opportunity. Um, hopefully, you'll catch them when they're going between holes or something, and that'll give you an opportunity to get a shot like this um, or this.
Okay. Um, so for uh, less than a handful of years, uh, I was going out to um, uh, the Badlands uh, mid December to maybe um, through January um, uh, to photograph bobcats. And that was the time at which um, the coyotes were uh, kind of thinned out. And so the bobcats had a chance to do their thing. Why I went out there in December, in December, was their, um, that's their breeding period. And so what is a nocturnal animal becomes diurnal, meaning they come out in the day because, you know, it's like the guys are interested in, you know, finding the gals and things like that. And so they'll, they'll, they'll be much more visible. And, um, um, and so you have more opportunity to, to photograph bomb kids. Other than that, they're normal, um, they're, they're normally night creatures. And so it's difficult. Uh, so where do you see bob? Uh, where do you see uh, uh, bobcats? Uh, you're going to find them where the prairie dog towns are. Okay, most of the pictures that you're going to see tonight were taken right around here. Uh, um, yeah, actually between Prairie Wind Overlook and Homestead Overlook. Um, uh, that's where most of the pictures that I'm going to show you, they're, they're, they've also been seen, and I've photographed them right near the Cedar Pass area. Okay. Um, but sometimes they'll thrill the locals and they'll hang out on a fence post or something right along 240 as you come into, uh, you know, if you're going to Wall or, or going into the park, uh, they'll be uh, on the right as you're coming into the park in the morning, sitting on a fence post or something. And so, so as you're coming in, check this out. Um, but if I'm looking for bobcats, the first place I'm going is, is right here. Uh, my plan B and C would be here. And then the Roberts, I, I've never photographed um, uh, bobcats in, in Roberts. I don't know why, um, but um, uh, actually, I think I might know why. Okay, so here's one of them. They're, when they're sitting out on the uh, hurry dog town there, I say the people who are with me, look for something the size of a bread box. When they're lying in the ground, they look about like that big. Okay, uh, they weigh about 30 pounds. And um, often what they'll do is there's the early risers. Um, if it's really an inclement day, don't bother because they're cats, they don't like being out in the rain and that sort of thing. And the prairie dogs don't like to come out either. And so you don't, you have enough time if you go through the panoramic overlook and get sunrise shots, you have enough time to get to the bobcat, to get to the prairie dog town where the bobcats, what they'll do is they'll post outside of a prairie dog hole and just wait for the first one to pop up. But prairie dogs are kind of shiftless and lazy and late sleepers, poor character all the way around. And but the the um, bobcats are very industrious. They will uh, they'll just sit there, and they may sit there for an hour. And and so it might be an opportunity for you to get a picture of a bobcat for an hour. And you're just saying, okay, move. And you're trying to you know so you you've gotten all the posting pictures. Now what you really want is some action. So you have to kind of be patient. And um, that's what that action might look like. Okay. So go out to the Prairie Dog Town um, and 
and just look for these little things that are about the size of a bread bar. And um, first thing in the morning. Uh, but if you don't get there before nine o'clock, that's okay too. Okay, because as long as the prairie dogs aren't out yet, uh, they're they're posting up. Um, these two were uh, from a family, and so I got to track them um, uh, over a season. Um, and um, so, um, so what mom does, um, she's raising uh, her litter, and you have to understand how the Badlands works and how the grasslands work. Okay, and so the prairie dog towns are often in the grassland part. And so when you're going down 240, very often on one side of the road is Badlands, and on the other side of the road is grassland. So mom's job is to go out into the grasslands, grab a prairie dog, and when she grabs that prairie dog, it yelps, makes a noise, very distinctive noise, okay? Which cues the coyotes. They know what's happened and they are opportunists. And so then she's got to hightail it back to the Badlands, okay? To where she's on equal footing. When she's by herself out in the prairie dog town, you may have a pack of coyotes. And so she's outnumbered. Um, on flat land, she's at a disadvantage. But once she gets into the Badlands, where her uh, kittens are, uh, then she's on equal footing. And so what she will do then is, is dress that prairie dog out and bring it in uh, to these guys who are waiting for her to come back. And she doesn't bring the food to the den. They have a meeting place, okay? Kitty's restaurant or something. I don't know, there's some meeting place. Uh, because it's a bad idea to take that smelly food to the den. So they cache it somewhere. And, and the little ones uh, know to meet her there. This is a guy, he's just waiting for the gals to show up. He's just setting himself. So here's a, a bobcat family. That's the mom I was telling you about. They look pretty happy. They've had their meal. They're looking literally at the sunset, just sunning themselves. Uh, this is the same family um, a month later. I went back and found them again and, and um, um, you know, they're just kind of hanging out. And so this is uh, um, the the young one just kind of hanging out. And here's mom doing some training. They all look really happy and healthy and, and well-fed. There's uh, mom, she's got uh, her prairie dog, and you can see she's in the grasslands, right? Here too. She's dressed out that, uh, that prairie dog, and now she's going to bring it back across that 240 into the Badlands and meet up with the kids. I think I put that one in twice. Um, Okay, any questions about bobcats? Buffalo um, are just uh, one of the features of the Badlands. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, I would encourage you to go both to the Badlands and to Custer uh, uh, to photograph the buffalo there. Uh, where do you see buffalo? Not everywhere in the Badlands. So, it's pretty, uh, very rarely do you ever see any buffalo uh, south of the pinnacles. 
they mostly are in this area near the pinnacle or down Sage Creek Rim Road, all through here. And then even as far out as uh, there's a kind of a camper area. Okay, so if you wanna see Buffalo, just go straight down from wall, turn right at the pinnacles and go all the way out to this campground. And you're, I almost guarantee you that you will see Buffalo. In fact, you might see Buffalo even coming in to the park. Um, I I have not taken my best buffalo shot yet. It eludes me. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, really, uh, when I when I see it, I'll know it. But uh, I I want to capture a buffalo uh, where it's. Uh, in contrast or somehow is defined uh, or you see the relationship of the buffalo to um, uh, the surroundings uh, because they are so much, they're so well um, um, geared towards the, the, the badlands topography and, and all that. I mean, it's like, uh, one of the most remarkable things you'll ever see is a buffalo um, in deep snow following its way. And, and you can just see it moving its head back and forth, just creating this road in front of it so uh, to walk through. And you just see how those muscles in the neck are all geared uh, for doing exactly what that animal is doing. They're so well adapted. Uh, I was talking to somebody who went out to the Badlands with uh, uh, infrared goggles, and they could not see the buffalo. This is in the middle of winter time, and they could not see the buffalo. And and why is that? Because with this fur and their hide, they don't give off any heat. And you could go out to the Badlands a week after a snowstorm and they still have snow crusted on them because it doesn't melt off. So unless they shake it off or, or roll and rub it off, that snow stays on them and it's great photography. Uh, this guy did say that it was kind of funny because when he was looking through with the RF glasses, he could see their eyeballs that the only place where the buffaloes gave off uh, heat was through their eyes, which I think is kind of cool. So I've been trying to capture different looks. Um, um, uh, let me just say some cautionary things about buffalo is um, um, people treat them like cows or like domestic, and they're not. They can move way farther. Uh, uh, much faster and jump higher than you could ever imagine. This animal can go 30 miles an hour um, and um, uh, you could take the biggest four wheel drive vehicle that you want and, uh, and the Buffalo is gonna win <laughs> if, if it decides to ram that, that uh, four wheel drive vehicle, even though because it's just this thin piece of metal keeping, you know, and, and uh, a buffalo charging at 30, uh, 25 or 30 miles an hour uh, could destroy any vehicle. Uh, and so what am I saying? I'm saying uh, typically they're used to people. Um, they're also used to people doing dumb things. Um, so going up and getting a selfie with a cell phone with a buffalo is not a good idea. Um, when I when I photograph buffalo, I, I um, the best way to do it, I think, is to stay within the profile of your vehicle, because and this this works for a lot of animals. Uh, they don't recognize you as a person, as a human being, until you leave that profile of the vehicle. So at that point, you become a a pattern that they recognize. As a, as a human being, why you're in the profile of the vehicle, 
that provides you with some safety. Um, and, and so staying close to your vehicle on the right side of the vehicle, so the vehicle is between you and the animal, um, or at least uh, a place where you can hide or, or dodge into if you need to. So um, I, I don't think that um, I've consciously, sometimes by accident, I found myself like really close, standing out in the open. Um, um, that's that's a pretty dangerous situation, and so I would encourage you not to to do that. Um, I love the way that I photograph buffalo. Is I look for uh, a day where the light is really really flat. Uh, because what I like to do is I like to uh, have the opportunity to overexpose, um, and I'm shooting you raw, uh, I'm overexposing the subject. Because, you know, if you have a really uh, bright day where the dynamic range is just infinite, and it's really hard for your camera to cope with that. So if you can photograph a buffalo where you've got a, the narrowest dynamic range possible. And so what that allows you to do in RAW is you can overexpose that creature uh, without, you don't wanna blow up whatever is lighter than the buffalo, but it gives you the ability to really push it. And so these, when you look at what I've come away with, the pictures look really overexposed. But when I get them in the Lightroom or Photoshop, then I just adjust the levels. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing the buffalo. I'm seeing the rich texture that exists that we don't often see uh, because our eyes shut down and our cameras can't pick it up because it's too bright. And so that's what I'm doing is I'm trying to find every little hair and uh, this is a buffalo in the springtime, so they look a little, uh, that's what they look like right now, if you go out there. Uh, so they're they're having bad hair days. Um, here's another example. But uh, the way that you can get this kind of texture and detail is by shooting it um, uh, when it's really flat light. This was actually shot in the fog. I did a series of, uh, of buffalo shots that I sepiaed, um, uh, and um, what they, I was kind of inspired by some of those 1800 uh, portraits that people did of buffalo back then. And I always thought, you know, there seems so contorted and unnatural. And then I realized that I was getting some of that same uh, images. So this is from that series. This is not a good thing to see. If you see this, you might be doing something wrong and you're gonna know about it. Okay, so if, the, if he seems to be making eye contact and the tail is doing his thing and he's pawing the ground with, um, then you might've violated his social space. Um, this is part of the series. Uh, we'll talk about the calves here in just a little bit. Right now is calving. I just saw, uh, uh, I just missed seeing a, a calf born. Uh, I was out at Fort Totten in North Dakota and, and you could see this young calf being licked off and still had his umbilical. Um, so I just love these contortions and and um, and I I love photographing um, buffalo in the snow. This is an example of like a foggy day where you can just get the textures and hear their fighting. Um, let's talk about. Red dogs. 
Theodore Roosevelt was out in the Badlands and he was touring around and he said, oh, I see all the buffalo, but what are these red dots? And of course, these, these young ones are born red. You, know, you wouldn't know it from this picture, but they're, they're red. And, uh, and so he went out there um, and he, he said that and it stuck. And so now um, people call them red dogs uh, because Peter Roosevelt did it. It's fun to see them doing things. Um, uh, when you get a full grown, full uh, buffalo throwing itself on the ground, you could be sitting in a car and it would shake. Uh, it's just really amazing. And then, of course, they make really nice silver. Every year, there's a Buffalo Roundup at uh, Custer. It's all of a sudden people uh, learned about it, and so it's well attended, probably too well attended. Uh, but there are all sorts of activities and fun things that go on. So if you just want a fun day and you want to see people riding horses, uh, cowboys uh, herding buffalo, um, it, it's pretty magnificent. Um, I was just there by accident. I've been there a couple of times, uh, both in the Badlands and at Custer, where... Um, um, they were doing roundup activities anyway. And uh, the reason I took this picture was uh, what they do is they sort the buffalo, okay? And, and they thin the herd like once a year. And they'll put different tags on the buffaloes. There's uh, the ones that they don't tag, they're probably keeping. Uh, if they have a blue tag, uh, they're being sold off. There's uh, uh, all the uh, tribal nations. Um, in uh, the 40, lower 48, probably Alaska too, uh, have first say over the buffalo. So, so anything that they uh, they get first shot at it, sometimes uh, those buffalo are shipped there to uh, to create herds or to punish other herds. Uh, um, sometimes they're shipped there for food to be used for food. The ones that don't get shipped to reservations are sold on and um, um, they end up uh, on buffalo farms. They may end up being food or, you know. Uh, but the reason I took this picture was when this particular individual showed up, it was like everybody got quiet. But this is a, apparently a three-year-old bull that is magnificent. And I mean, when you see this animal, he's clearly special. And so everybody just, I mean, there was just like, there was, everybody was quiet just looking at this, this young bull, which I'm sure they hung on to. Bighorn sheep. Um, for years, we would, uh, the day of Thanksgiving, uh, my wife didn't always appreciate this. Uh, we would, after eating a big meal and all that, at about two in the morning, we would take off to the bed. Okay, and we would get there, reason, I don't know, it seemed to make sense at the time, but we'd get there at about eight in the morning and we'd have a, you know, a day of shooting. Um, and so, um, the bighorn sheep rut starts kind of in that time frame and goes like it might be a couple of days before Thanksgiving all the way to maybe about December 3rd. Um, and so this is their big mating thing where they do all the dominant stuff. Um, and so where do you see bighorn sheep in the <laughs> bad land? The Pinnacles is really bighorn sheep central. Okay. And so a lot of the pictures that you're going to see, even the best ones, were actually taken um, right along, right through here. Um, 
you'll also see big heart sheet on this side. Uh, and then um, there's some uh, antenna, there's like an antenna farm over here that, so this whole area right here is where you're most likely to see big heart sheep. Having said that, uh, there's also some big heart sheep activity down on this end of the park. Um, and so from the visitor center in to like maybe, um, I, I kind of, I, I've not seen much after fossil exhibit trip. So like right in here, bighorn sheep as well. Um, and, and so um, when the rut starts, uh, you'll see them, uh, the males kind of go nuts and trying to, they're trying to establish hierarchy. And uh, so uh, the, the top ram ends up being the head of the harem. It's very similar to what happens with deer too. You'll see this is an unusual profile. This is, you see how the spine is straight? Okay, and the head isn't, okay. So that makes for pretty good ramming. Um, and, and so they have these horns, sometimes the old, folks, old guys, sometimes you'll see them really busted up. Sometimes you'll see them bleeding. Um, and um, uh, when they um, when they run into each other, you can hear the noise sometimes, like more than a half, well, a half a mile away, you can hear the echo. And um, uh, and so a lot of the activity is actually male on male. And, and so it's the, the more dominant uh, individuals asserting themselves. And then you get these young adolescents that are just full of it and they want to make a name for themselves. And so you see all this kind of dominant sort of behavior, like I'm bigger than you are. And you see how Sometimes these horns get busted up. Sometimes they get tangled. Um, and this is all about pushing and shoving and, and kind of bullying one another. Um, this shows you just how serious it can get. You have this, uh, this you who's just beginning estrus, and uh, they can sense it, uh, smell her, and for whatever reason, she wants to elude them. So here she's climbing out on this uh, very loose kind of popcorn sedimentary structure. And you just wonder, you know, what's keeping her there because it's almost straight up and down. And then you see these two guys, they weigh almost 300 pounds and they are pounding on each other. And, and you know, um, uh, they're so well adapted. And uh, the only way that this picture makes any sense to me is if these animals are filled with helium. Okay, but, but this is serious business. They're fighting, I don't want to say to the death, but they are de definitely fighting to win. And you can see that both of them are very large um, individuals and, and pretty mature. And you see that there's just nothing holding this, this uh, soil together. Finally, this guy runs this other guy off. So you see that sort of behavior. Uh, this is not a photoshopped image. It was kind of interesting that they get kind of a, a bookends effect where you had um, almost identical individuals postured the same way and then these two guys um, going at it. One of the problems of doing these photographs is often it's hard to get a clean shot of them running into each other because there's bystanders 
and observers. This picture was taken in a blizzard. There was 60 mile an hour sustained winds and there had been an ice storm. And so standing, uh, it, was, it was very icy, but they love it because when they're doing, uh, they're fighting, um, they're ramming each other, um, they get overheated. And so they love it when it's inclement and it's cold and it's windy um, because then they can really go to town and not get overheated. So what you'll see is that they um, they will rise up and, and kind of fall towards each other. Um, that's one of the the ways they ran into each other. I wonder if I can do that again. Okay, go for it. I've done this like 30 times. It's always the same ending. <laughs> Keep trying. Okay, so here's another. And so the sound that you would hear, you can hear a long ways away. So the and sometimes it's funny because they they both look dazed when they're when they're done, and they'll stand there just for a little time collecting themselves. So so remember how I said no snow in the Badlands in the winter. Okay, so this happened like the first week in December. Okay, how am I doing for time, guys? Are you guys? We're good. Okay. Uh, about 10 more minutes. Okay, yeah. I just thought I'd talk a little bit about equipment. So what do you go out to the Badlands with? Um, typically, what I'll do is I will uh, set up two camera bodies. Uh, one is for long and one is for super long. Okay, and that, uh, so I might have a, uh, uh, a 70 to 200, or maybe even um, a 24 to 70. Okay, but I'll have a shorter lens, but that has some reach to it. And then I'll have uh, something that is longer than 500. And the reason I do that is that, especially with Buffalo, uh, Sometimes you're too close. And so you need that that shorter long lens to be able to uh, not be too close. And and so they uh, you might say, well, why don't you put on a wide angle for the vistas in a long lens? And I'll say, well, because if I'm gonna do a vista, I'm gonna be thoughtful, it will be planned and and um, get out my tripod and all that. And what lens is on my camera uh, is something that is done more planfully. Uh, so I very often say to myself, damn it, I've got the wrong lens and it's never the wide angle. It's that shorter long lens is the one that's the wrong one on my camera. So for many years, my bread and butter lens was uh, of the Canon 500 F. And, and probably one of the best wildlife cameras out there for many years was the Canon uh, 70 Mark II. Um, it was just really a good camera. And um, that was back in the DSL days. Um, I found that the 5D Mark IV, which is probably you know, if I had to pick a DSLR um, and not a mirrorless, that's probably the camera that I would pick. Uh, it's just so very capable. And, um, and and so that's the type of gear that I would go out there with. Now, I am I went to mirrorless. I'm confessing, guys. Um, 
And I've got two wonderful cameras, the 7R4 and then the 9, the A9 II Mark II. And um, what I like about the, uh, the, the 7R4 is a 71 megapixel sensor. Um, so when I put that on uh, a long lens, and I still need more length, the way that I get it is by using that big ass sensor and cropping. Okay, so that probably gives me, I'm going to say, another 200 millimeters. So if I've got it set up with a 600 millimeter with a 1.4, and then an ability to crop, you know, I probably have about an effective range, focal length range of about a thousand millimeters. In wildlife photography, sometimes that makes it, it, it could make the difference of getting a shot that's usable and one that isn't. So that's, it doesn't fire a lot of frames per second, but you know, I kind of grew up in the old days where anything more than seven was pretty fantastic. So it'll fire 10. Um, the Sony A9 II will fire 20 frames per second, which just scares me. Because, but it's only 24 megapixel. But what makes this a fabulous camera is its ability, um, it is such powerful um, tracking ability. Uh, so if you want to do birds in flight, um, um, it it will lock onto a bird and you can fire 20 frames and have them all be tack sharp. So it's for a very capable camera. I think the best camera out there right now is a Canon. I think it's an R5 is the one that people, if you don't want to go Sony and you want to go mirrorless, uh, a Canon uh, R5s are just um, amazing. There it is. I forgot that I even put it up there. Okay, 12 frames per second and 45 megapixel. It's a nice in-between camera from the one that I just showed, the two that I just showed you. But it's it's also got amazing, um, it does 20 frames per second too. Um, uh, but it, it's focusing um, ability is a smidgen better than the Sony, they say. Um, it's really hard to do wildlife if you don't have at least 300 millimeter. Uh, there are lots of options these days that gets you more into the 400 or 500 range. And um, this, I call it a Tupperware lens, um, where Canon put, put out this 800 millimeter F11 yuck. Uh, and it's just this plastic shell Reminds me of a Tupperware container, but it's a it's a pretty good lens, and it's only nine hundred dollars. Um, and eight hundred millimeters is wonderful. Uh, Cameron and Sigma both have products in this range. They're they're about the same price. Um, that's really not a bad way to go. The Sony version of this is double. Then there's the Sigma, and the Sigma has two. We used to call the one on the bottom, the 60, the 600. I think back in the day, it was actually, um, they had a five, a 50 to 500 that we called the Big Bar, you know. So, but they're all kind of um, in that same price range. Um, my bread and butter lens, I replaced my 500 Canon. Um, with this one, um, and I'm not looking back. It's just wonderful. Um, and to say that when you've been used to using a prime lens, a zoom lens, uh, what I like about it is its weight. I didn't think that that would ever matter to me, but it does. It's lighter, and it doesn't do that sneaky moving in and out as you um, as you refocus as you change the. Um, as you zoom in. So it stays the same length. And why that's good is if you have it on a tripod, 
Um, anything that moves is going to shift the balance and kind of mess up your gimbal and and that sort of thing. And so that's really a nice lens. And then almost any lens, um, well, Sony has a 100 to 400, which um, there are people always debating which is the better. And, and um, I've had friends of mine sell their 100 to 400 to get the 200 to 600. The 1.4 uh, teleconverter works really well on both of these. Um, some people even go to 2x, but I'm conservative. I don't believe in it. 1.4 is fine. There you go. And um, I don't hand hold much of anything when I'm out in the field. The way that I, uh, I put my long lens um, on a monopod, which gives me great mobility. So I can grab that and just run. Um, and and uh, so that gives me the mobility and the stability that I, so, um, so typically I'm not using a tripod when I'm shooting in the Badlands, I'm, I'm shooting with a monopod. Um, there's my website, jarthuranderson.com. Um, and feel free to look around the end. Thank you. Fabulous, thank you. Wonderful pictures, great, great monologue, very helpful. Um, in a second, I will. Does anybody have any questions? It's a lot of information. Well, you've recorded it, right? Perfect. So, are we putting it on our YouTube channel? Most likely.